Hi, everyone. My name is Asmara Askerom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center for Global Security Research. Uh, thank you for joining today's lecture. Our speaker today is Jamie Kwong. Jamie is a fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, today, she'll be discussing her latest paper called How Climate Change Challenges the U.S. Nuclear Deterrent. You, you can download a copy of Jamie's paper um, on Carnegie's website. So Jamie's paper assesses how climate change will affect the capacity of U.S. nuclear systems to support the nation's uh, deterrence mission. The paper concludes with five recommendations on how uh, the U.S. Department of Defense and Department of Energy can better prepare to mitigate and adapt to these challenges. So Jamie will speak for about 45 minutes today, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for a Q&A session. Feel free to raise your hand uh, during her lecture, and um, I'll just call on you when the Q&A session starts. But if you raise your hand beforehand, that allows us to just kind of head straight into it. Um, so with that, Jamie, it's a pleasure to welcome you to CGSR. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, and I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Great. Well, firstly, thank you so much, Azra and Katie, for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here and share my findings and engage with you all. Um, so through Azra's really helpful introduction, you kind of have a rough idea of what the research is. But just to give you a sense of what the impetus was for this project. So the idea was that essentially we're investing billions of dollars to modernize the U.S. nuclear arsenal. And of course, that's to ensure that our weapons can deliver the deterrence mission for decades to come, right? 40 plus years in most instances. And this is, of course, motivated, at least in part, to address a changing geostrategic environment. But I was left with the question of how much do these plans account for a changing geophysical environment? And so that's really kind of the framing uh, that drove the research, right? How could climate change affect the capacity of our nuclear systems to support the U.S. deterrence mission? My key finding, bottom line up front, is essentially that climate change could have detrimental impacts on each leg of the U.S. nuclear triad. And I assess this by first considering the local impacts on a base that hosts each system. And from there, then kind of zooming out and considering the broader implications for the deterrence mission of each leg. And I'll flag, as is probably obvious, that my research specifically focused on climate change challenges to the U.S. nuclear enterprise by way of DOD facilities. But my findings and these bigger picture takeaways and recommendations, I think, are still of importance and relevance to NNSA as well, both in terms of, you know, the agency's role in the nuclear enterprise, as well as this eventual spillover into the civil nuclear sector. And a final note before diving in, just to flag, I sit in a think tank. So all of this research is as was available in the open source. So let me first start with some context and I'll go ahead and pull up my slides from here. If you just give me one sec. There we go. Okay, so the context here is essentially climate change is a threat multiplier, right? This notion that climate change can exacerbate existing security challenges. But in many ways, it's also a security threat in and of itself. And USG has really undertaken a series of important steps to recognize it as such, right? President Biden issued an executive order upon taking office that tasked all departments to, quote, put the climate crisis at the center of United States foreign policy and national security. Some of the results of that are uh, the Department of Energy's Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan and the more recent progress report. And on the DOD side, the Climate Risk Analysis, Climate Adaptation Plan, and also the development of a tool, the DOD Climate Assessment Tool, or DCAP for short, that provides a screening level assessment of installations exposure to various climate hazards. All of this is very important and absolutely should be applauded and continued. But I think we're still missing a specific, systematic, and sustained focus on the implications of climate change for the deterrent. And this is a problematic gap given the centrality of nuclear weapons to U.S. national security interests, to say nothing of the scale of resources already slated for modernizing these systems, right? So outside of USG, there are others who have looked at the climate nuclear nexus, but they're typically focused on one of two areas. So firstly, the disastrous environmental consequences of a nuclear blast, and I include here research that examines how climate change could undermine the integrity of sites that store waste from nuclear testing programs. 
And secondly, the role of nuclear power in the clean energy transition, importantly, including the safety and security considerations of climate change for states with civil nuclear programs. And again, this is really important, but I think it still lacks attention to the potential ways climate change could affect how the United States bases, postures, and operates its nuclear weapons. And so that's where I tried to jump in with my research. And again, I kind of organized it by case study around each leg of the triad. And I selected a representative base that houses, maintains, and operates each system uh, and considered the local impacts of climate change for that mission. I then generalized how those climate change impacts may affect the larger deterrence mission of each leg. In terms of the climate change modeling side of things, I drew on climate models that track relevant climate hazards, so namely sea level rise, extreme flooding, and extreme heat, as I'll get into. And I assessed plausible future scenarios based along two dimensions. So firstly, lower emissions and higher emissions greenhouse gas pathways, so essentially intermediate and higher future warming scenarios. And secondly, in terms of timelines, I based these projections on mid-century and late-century timelines. The goal was to try to track these climate change projections onto the service lives of the systems that are currently under development as part of the U.S. modernization efforts. So the Columbia class submarines, the Sentinel ICBM, and the B-21 bomber, with the caveat that the expected service life of the B-21 is not available in the open source, I made my best guess. So in short, I had four climate change scenarios for each leg of the triad. And the final caveat before I jump in, just to say that the climate modeling and this analysis of the potential implications on the base and deterrence mission that I consider should all be considered as potential future outcomes, not predictions. But given the stakes of nuclear weapons, I think this potentiality itself merits careful consideration. So jumping into my first case, you can see here, uh, I looked specifically at Kings Bay Naval Base, the Atlantic hub of the SSBN fleet. Um, and there's one on-base nuclear facility of particular relevance to this analysis. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, uh, but the Strategic Weapons Facility Atlantic or SWIFTLANT for short, which is comprised of this building complex here, as well as two explosive handling wharfs on the waterfront. And this facility is tasked with storing, maintaining, and assembling the Trident II D5 SLBMs in their warheads. So unsurprisingly here, in terms of climate effects, I was looking specifically at sea level rise as the most relevant potential impact. And so this map I'm displaying here shows two sea level rise scenarios in 2050 on the left and 2080 on the right. And these projections are based off of the 2022 NOAA sea level rise technical report. So this intermediate scenario, which is the more navy blue here, uh, is an indication of global mean sea level rise that's projected to rise by one meter by 2100, and these are the local effects down in Georgia. And so to note, this projection, this intermediate scenario, tracks quite closely with the current observation-based trajectory. So in terms of probability, is along our current observation. The high sea level rise scenario, which is more of the teal color that you can see, is uh, where global mean sea level rise is projected to rise by two meters by 2100. And in terms of probability, it's fairly unlikely under any IPCC emission scenario and warming pathway, but we can't discount it, right? There's still some processes that may contribute to sea level rise and could become prominent con contributors that we may not fully understand. In terms of timeline, again, 2050 will be about the half-life of the new Columbia-class submarines, and 2080 will be about the estimated end of service life for the submarines. And one final note about this map is that it does not show storm surge from an extreme event like a hurricane. Global warming is expected to contribute to an increase in the severity of extreme events like hurricanes, but it's really difficult to project the frequency of such extremes. So I excluded it here to have a more conservative estimate. So what does this mean for the base? Well, expectedly, the area at the waterfront that you can see here uh, and on this map as well um, is expect expectedly below the annual flood level. But I wanna bring attention to this key road here that based on satellite imagery, seems to be the primary road that connects the Swiftland complex to the explosive handling wharfs at the waterfront. 
and it's going to be flooded where this key river here divides the complex from the waterfront. And of course, this potential severity uh, expectedly increases from the intermediate to the high sea level rise scenario and from the 2050 to the 2080 time horizons and would only be exacerbated by storm surge. So in terms of Kings, Bay's, uh, Kings Bay uh, and its deterrence mission, this really suggests that climate change could plausibly compromise the SWIFTLAND mission, which requires reliable transport routes uh, for the D-5 missiles to go to and from the submarines, right? Presumably, again, open source, the D-5 missiles are assembled at the SWIFTLAND complex, and presumably uh, the missiles are loaded and unloaded onto the subs in the explosive handling wharfs. When fully assembled, these missiles weigh 30,000 pounds, right? 1.6 times heavier than the federal limit for interstate highways. So this means that the roads really need to be quite robust to bear the substantial weight of the D5 transports. But with more regular flooding on larger swaths of the road, the, the Navy will likely have to build more bridges, there's already two of them, and regularly expend resources to reinforce those bridges and the roads themselves. That's surely a cost, right? What's more problematic is if the road becomes unusable at time. At times, this could hamper the base's ability to ensure that the subs are equipped with viable missiles, right? This is, of course, relevant to regular maintenance and also because we already know that the missiles on the first eight Columbia class subs will have to be replaced by a further life extended D5 missile. So we really need to ensure that this road is a, a reliable transport route more frequent and severe flooding that impacts the transport of missiles could delay or even upset these operations. And it could even affect readiness if, for example, a submarine deployment is delayed because missile servicing disrupt was disrupted by a particularly extreme flood. In addition to the swift land issue, we of course see inundation at the waterfront here, that is the waters pushing more and more inland. And that becomes a problem in terms of the usability and accessibility of the waterfront with potentially quite costly impacts if the Navy has to raise or fully locate some of these facilities. But to flag, the Navy is particularly attuned to climate change effects at its coastal installations, right? They're undertaking projects with local community partners at Kings Bay, as an example, to increase the base's resilience and uh, conserve both natural habitats through built and natural infrastructure solutions. So something like a living shoreline. And this particular project I'm referencing is part of the DOD Readiness and Environmental Integration Protection Integration Program, which will come up in my recommendations later. Uh, but in terms of the broader SSBN mission, significant challenges still remain, right? Kings Bay is one of only two bases that hosts SSBNs. And so climate change effects that disrupt the base's capacity to service and maintain submarines has implications for the broader deterrence mission of the submarine leg. It's particularly problematic if, a, if the base was made inaccessible at times, right? Rather through a particularly severe flood more incremental sea level rise or a severe weather event. If the, the base becomes inaccessible, this has implications for both crew exchanges and maintenance. So on the crew exchanges side, these exchanges can be conducted at sea and it really does seem like the Navy is exercising this capacity more regularly, but it nevertheless requires the submarines to surface, which makes them more detectable, at least for the time it takes to swap out the crews. In terms of maintenance, though, there's generally 35 days worth of servicing after each deterrent patrol, and this maintenance would have to be put off if the submarines can't enter port. So in some, climate change could affect the health and stealth of the submarine leg. That is, it could increase the vulnerability of the most survivable leg of the triad, which in turn could require the U.S. to significantly adapt its SSBN posture. Notably, these challenges and these potential changes to SSBN operations may be speculative, but they're certainly not implausible, right? And this really gets to the main point that we need to be thinking through these potential big picture implications of climate change. And just a, a final flag on this case is that implications of climate change at Kings Bay also would impact the UK deterrent. Right. The UK doesn't own its own missiles, rather it's purchased rights to US Trident missiles, which it replenishes at Kings Bay. So if the US submarines can't access Kings Bay, that could be particularly detrimental since the UK only relies on this single delivery platform. Okay, moving on to my 
land leg case. Uh, so here I looked specifically at Minot Air Force Base, which of course hosts both the B-52 bombers and the Minuteman three ICBMs. I specifically and exclusively focused on the ICBM mission here. So historical events suggest that extreme flooding might be relevant for Minot's ICBM mission. But the problem here is that I can't model extreme flooding over long time horizons. That is, I can't track this flooding onto the estimated service life of the Sentinel ICBMs. So in my report, I instead consider warming and precipitation trends, which can be tracked to mid-century and late century. And you can see my table here. In terms of warming, under both lower emissions and higher emissions pathways in mid-century and late century, we can expect more extremely hot days, which are defined as days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And this could have impacts on things like snowmelt. It could not only start that winter thawing process early in the year, but it could potentially make it happen faster, which of course increases flood risks. In terms of precipitation, we don't actually project that much change, but warming means greater, more vari greater variability will become more common and low probability, but severe events like extreme flooding are a product of that kind of variability. So then thinking, okay, what would these flood implications look like at Minot? Well, unfortunately we have evidence to draw on from the historical flood in 2011, which inundated the city of Minot, which is about 14 miles south of the base, I believe. And it displaced about a quarter of the population, including over 1100 airmen and their families. And there was no reported direct damage to the base, uh, but according to some coverage, we saw that seven launch facilities were made inaccessible due to damage and flooding on access roads. And reportedly the base also had to cut its water consumption in half because it relied on commercial water utilities. And outside of the flood itself, but related to the year's large snow melt, uh, the base did indicate that it had months of instances where it had to rely on sandbags and water pumps to prevent water infiltration issues across the missile field. So in my report to try to help visualize this, I provide a map of Minot's missile field with as much flooding data as is available, namely from the FEMA National Flood Hazard Layer. Um, and so here you can see 100 year flood zones, which have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year and 500 year flood zones in the inset map, which have a 0.2% chance of flooding in a given year. My big caveat here though, is uh, that this FEMA flooding data doesn't cover the complete area and is not up to date, which likely has to do with a population density issue of how FEMA prioritizes its locations. But with these limitations aside, I rely on this data nonetheless, given its recognition as an authoritative source. And more importantly, because the Air Force also relied on this data and its environmental impact statement for the Sentinel program. So in terms of implications for Minot, more severe flooding or even a cascade of smaller flooding events could impact Minot's ICBM deterrence mission. It could displace base personnel and their families, as we saw in 2011, which of course has implications for morale, staffing, and even the personnel reliability program. Water infiltration at the launch facilities or missile alert facilities has already been recognized as a fairly regular issue, and accelerated flooding could only exacerbate those challenges and require more mitigation efforts and resources with both budgetary and personnel considerations. But that kind of water infiltration issue would likely be more of a nuisance than something that would really cause a substantial change in base operations. The bigger issue, I think, is if the access roads are inundated or compromised in any ways, and that has implications for both staffing and maintenance. On the staffing side of things, this may require a change in shift schedules or procedures in the event of an extreme flood, I think similar to what the Air Force saw during COVID. But notably, the helicopter squadron based at Minot could mitigate this staffing impact. But the helicopters couldn't mitigate the maintenance challenge given the sheer weight of many of the trucks and maintenance materials, right? These access roads, many of which are basically dirt roads, are not really equipped for heavy machinery as is, let alone if they're compromised by flooding. 
And to note, there is a special program for maintaining roads like this called the Defense Access Roads Program. But from what I understand, it doesn't have the permanent funds likely needed for upkeep if you know the region experiences more severe floods or has more frequent flooding issues. So I think we really need more proactive efforts to ensure these roads remain usable in the face of more severe flooding events. Zooming out, you know, thinking about the ICBM mission more broadly, I think this type of flooding is unlikely to cause inaccessibility issues at all launch facilities or missile alert facilities, let alone at the same time, right? So this probably doesn't fundamentally undermine the mission, especially since there's two other ICBM bases. Although I will flag that all three of the bases and the silo fields are in the Missouri River Basin. So there is a possibility that they could all be impacted, but probably not in the same way or at the same extremes uh, from a particularly wet year. But just to say, at minimum, they're kind of interconnected in an environmental sense, if you will. But the accessibility issue brought on by extreme flooding events could have cascading effects on the ICBM mission, right? Inaccessibility to silos or disruption of maintenance caused by these events are particularly problematic if we're thinking about the transfer of weapons or limited life components. So to the first on maintenance and deliveries, events can disrupt, these types of events can disrupt the deliveries of weapons or components, which could then delay potentially critical time sensitive maintenance for other missiles. And of course, this is especially a big issue if any of these deliveries get caught in an extreme vent themselves. And in terms of limited life components, if these components aren't replaced within a specified time, that could undermine the reliability of the weapon itself, eventually to the point of non-operationality. So collectively, this speaks to a sort of supply chain issue, if you will, that could potentially undermine the reliability of some missiles, again, though likely not all of the missiles at once. But this possibility that climate change could impact the reliability of some missiles should be a consideration and factored into how we're thinking about the U.S. capacity to maintain the ICBM leg based on current planning. Okay, shifting over to the air leg. So I specifically looked at Whiteman Air Force Base, which of course, of course hosts the B-2 bombers. And here the aircraft are stored in special climate controlled hangars in part due to the sensitivity of the aircraft's uh, radar absorbent skin. And those hangars are located near the base's weapons storage facility where you can see that on the map. Um, and this is currently the only US bomber base to host gravity bombs that can be loaded onto the B-2s. But the, the U.S. Uh, government is expanding this amidst uh, con the construction and deployment of the B-21 system, which as far as we know in the open source will be capable of carrying both gravity bombs and new launched air, uh, new launched, sorry, new air launched nuclear cruise missiles, of course, in addition to conventional payloads. In terms of climate effects, the region is generally characterized by quite variable weather. So across all the cases, this was really the hardest to model in terms of climate changes and trends, which is an important recognition that not all climate change modeling and monitoring can be standardized across DOD or DOE installations. But I think there's still two climate change effects relevant to think about here, and that's heat and flash flooding. So I have a similar table to the Minot case here. And so in terms of heat, like Minot, uh, this can be reasonably projected into the future where we can expect not only more days greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but also greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In terms of flash flooding, warmer temperatures can cause more extreme precipitation events. Hotter air holds more moisture and thus increases the intensity of rainfall. So when it rains, it'll rain harder, which just increases the risk of flash flooding. So what does this mean for Whiteman? Well, in terms of heat, this has implications for both systems and personnel. So hot weather impacts training and cockpit time. So we're likely to see more black flag days with limited outdoor training and activity capacity. And extreme temperatures can also ground aircraft and or affect fuel and payload capacity given an air density issue. And Full disclosure in the public's uh, open source, I don't know the exact grounding temperature for B2s, let alone B21s, but I could expect it around 120 degrees Fahrenheit given some commercial similarities. And we are expected to hit that level in the higher emissions late century scenario in, in Whiteman. 
But even if we're not reaching these grounding level temperatures, the BTUs have to be stored in climate controlled hangars because of the sensitivity of the plane's skin, right? It already requires special maintenance that's likely only going to get more challenging in extreme heat and humidity. Again, this is unclear how exactly it translates to the B-21s, but expecting something similar is not really out of the question. And of course, this also means expending more energy and budgetary resources to keep hangars sufficiently cool on more increasingly hot days. In terms of flash floods, the flooded runway issue is really key here, as we saw play out at Offutt Air Force Base in March 2019, of course, home of US Strategic Command. This, of course, creates problems for the planes taking off, right? At Offutt, nine aircraft had to be emergency evacuated and the rest were grounded until the runway was cleared. So for the stealth bombers at Whiteman, even if they can take off, there's limited locations they can go with climate controlled hangars and capacity to care for the planes. And importantly, it means that the, the aircraft would be separated from Whiteman's nuclear weapons storage site until the runway was cleared. And this is where we really get at implications for the bomber mission, right? If climate change could affect the times and conditions when bombers can freely take off from or land at Whiteman, that's an issue. Of course, these planes are backstopped by the B-52s, which are based at Minot and Barksdale, but B-52s aren't stealth planes like the B-2s and future B-21s, so they might not be able to fulfill the same mission requirements. Notably, the B-21s will be based at two bases in addition to Whiteman, which are located in different regions of the U.S., so it's unlikely that any particular climate hazard would impact the bases to the same extent at the same time. But even a diversification of base locations doesn't really entirely resolve this storage site issue, right? While you can move the planes, you can't move the weapon storage sites. So climate change effects could force bombers to separate from their home base storage sites for unplanned periods of times. And if they can't be loaded onto the stealth bombers as planned, that could undermine the readiness of the air leg of the triad. Expanding bomber bases as part of the modernization could, of course, help alleviate the storage site issue, but depending on how many weapons are stored at each base and which bombers are assigned nuclear missions in U.S. war plans, that lack of access to the affected base's storage site could still pose significant challenges to the bomber leg mission. To flag here, as is probably aware, this was the hardest case in terms of climate change projections, but I think it still merits attention. Again, this mere possibility that climate change could undermine the readiness of the bomber fleet or affect DOD's capacity to store weapons and load them onto bombers may require reevaluation of the resilience of bomber facilities and operations. And importantly, I think this storage site issue raises some potential questions for NNSA facilities as well, right? We've seen wildfires affect and threaten LANL already, right? The lab has been evacuated, uh, as was the surrounding city, with, of course, huge impacts on personnel. This risk of wildfire is only exacerbated by the extreme heat and mega drought in New Mexico, which will likely continue to threaten the lab as well as the Kirtland underground, underground munitions maintenance and storage complex just south of Los Alamos. And I believe the weapons there awaiting dismantlement may have some NNSA equities, but regardless, while underground, the fact that the weapons are underground ensures the weapons themselves are somewhat insulated from these climate changes. The wildfires could pose challenges to nuclear related activities and, of course, personnel. So the bottom line here is really climate change poses challenges to our abilities to store warheads as well. And this additional kind of focus outside of the bases themselves, I think, speaks to a need to expand this research to think beyond things like bases and the individual legs, right? To think about storage, waste streams, and NSA, NNSA facilities, as well as the civil nuclear sites. And so that leads me to my recommendations very conveniently. Uh, so as I said earlier, all of these climate effects are really based on current projected trends. Whether they actually materialize will depend on how USG responds to these challenges, right? If they can implement effective adaptation and mitigation measures. So here's some uh, types of measures that I could envision could be helpful. So first, uh, DOD and DOE uh, should conduct detailed climate change vulnerability assessments of all their nuclear installations and facilities, right? With the goal really being determining how and when climate change could impact 
each site's unique nuclear systems, operations, and activities. And from what I gather, there's a high level version of this in the works as part of the FY20 NDAA, and also per the DOE Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan, I think a good number of DOE facilities have been evaluated. What I'd suggest is it's really important that these efforts uh, have sufficient detail, and they also consider the implications for the broader nuclear enterprise, the broader deterrence mission, if any of these nuclear operations or activities are compromised or undermined by climate change in any way. And while certainly there should be classified versions of this, I think we also need to see unclassified versions, right? There can be greater collaboration with interagency and non-governmental entities to develop effective mitigation and adaptation measures and to ensure proper oversight. And these should really start now, especially since any implementation of any of these measures would likely involve uh, significant resource allocation, infrastructure updates, and the like that take a lot of time. Second, I suggest that USG should invest in dynamic climate change modeling. And I think this is especially where DOE and NSA can and should play a particularly big role, especially given last year's significant advancement in advanced uh, investment in advanced climate modeling. So the goal, of course, here is to ensure that nuclear decisions and planning about the enterprise are informed by the most accurate climate change projections. And this really gets to the point that not all climate hazards can be reasonably projected onto the time horizons in which we're making nuclear decisions. And on top of that, projections can change, right? At a global or national level, if countries undertake significant efforts or not to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that could change these projections. And at a more local level, if DOD or NNSA are undertaking efforts to mitigate some of these effects through natural and built infrastructure solutions, that could have a positive effect as well. So we need to monitor climate change and update our models regularly, and then update our nuclear decisions and planning accordingly. And this will also help to ensure that climate change investments are more proactive and not just reactive, right? We're anticipating possible future incidents and not just focusing our resources where disaster has already struck, which is probably especially important for these landlocked nuclear installations and facilities. And of course, the goal here is to ensure uh, that this is facilitated and informed by interagency and non-governmental partnerships. So that REPI program I mentioned before, the Readiness Environmental Protection Integration Program, I think is a great example of how local, state, and federal stakeholders have come together to develop conservation and resilience measures to protect local and military interests. As far as I know, these programs do not exist at all nuclear sites, including NNSA facilities. So this would be a great way to expand that. Recommendation three. So here, my suggestion is that, you know, USG agencies should be required to complete forward-looking studies of the potential climate change impacts on any future nuclear actions. So these uh, studies would complement environmental impact statements, which are uh, consider how an action will impact the environment. The point here is we also need to think about how the environment will impact that action. And the goal would be to anticipate and plan for climate change impacts over the lifetime of the system or activity. And important here are implications uh, for the lifetime costs of the action, right? Factoring in costs to mitigate climate change impacts into the larger system. Uh, because of course, mitigation measures, especially if they're implemented later on, could significantly increase the lifetime costs of the system. And these, of course, should start with the construction and deployment of modernized systems, including at relevant NNSA facilities and other equities. Fourth, it would be great if USG can adopt a mission level focus in climate adaptation planning. And from what I gather from the DOE uh, adaptation plan, there is a consideration of different mission needs. I just suggest to ensure that this mission framing focus is really prioritized to really facilitate resource allocation and ensure climate considerations are really integrated into higher level decision making and strategies. And a key interagency deliverable here should be a dedicated climate action plan or strategy for the US nuclear enterprise and deterrence mission. So of course, this would draw on a number of stakeholders across DOD and NSA, the services, the different installations and the like. 
And finally, I suggest uh, that, you know, we should integrate climate change scenario exercises into nuclear planning and decision making. So this would be to exercise various climate change scenarios, such as climate crises at specific nuclear facilities, or even an opportunistic adversary taking advantage of a climate crisis, and bring together folks to evaluate the impact that would have on deterrence efforts, and from there, develop effective mitigation and adaptation measures, and then feed all of that into nuclear planning and decisions. So the goal really is to fully scope out and think through the risks and challenges posed by climate change to the nuclear enterprise. This, of course, has implications at the local and global nuclear facility level in terms of operations, impacts on waste streams, nuclear command and control, local communities, and personnel. So with that, those are all of my recommendations, but since I have a little bit of more time before wrapping up, I, I wanted to briefly move beyond the report to emphasize that these impacts are likely not isolated to the US and may be especially pressing for states like North Korea and Pakistan, uh, which is already feeling the acute effects of extreme climate hazards. So North Korea, for example, faced a huge flood in 2020 that threatens the Yongbyon Nuclear Scientific Research Center. Luckily, some key reactors were offline at the time, so damage to a dam that ensures a constant water supply to the cooling systems there didn't inflict much harm. They might not be so lucky in the future, right? And in terms of Pakistan, of course, the country experienced record-breaking floods back in 2022 that luckily spared nuclear energy facilities, but regions of some suspected nuclear weapon sites were among the most devastated. Climate change is only expected to cause more extreme precipitation events that are likely to exacerbate these flooding and thus nuclear challenges. In terms of other states, wildfires have historically threatened Russian ICBMs and those wildfires are only likely to get worse with more extreme heat. The UK, as I said, only relies on SSBNs operated out of a single coastal base, so it may be particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. And India's coastal nuclear facilities are projected to face more intense cyclones as global temperatures rise. So what does this mean for nuclear deterrence on a global scale? Well, it's hard to imagine that climate change would entirely undermine the complex enterprises, systems, and operations involved in nuclear weapons programs and their deterrence missions. But incidents and accidents caused or exacerbated by climate change could still have widespread effects, right? Especially since these climate risks could exacerbate existing nuclear risks. So for example, increased force vulnerability is largely recognized as an escalation driver. Climate change is increasing the vulnerability of all states' arsenals and thus stands to exacerbate escalation risks. So it seems quite plausible that climate change could significantly affect global nuclear dynamics. But a potential positive note to end on, since all nuclear armed states are vulnerable to climate impacts on their nuclear arsenals, there may be mutual interest in adopting measures to reduce associated risks, right? At minimum, this could entail a dialogue on best practices for assessing and mitigating climate change challenges to nuclear programs, right? This could open up avenues for cooperation on things like sharing the latest climate research to really ensure states are better prepared to address these common challenges. More ambitiously and recognizing this might not be the right time, common climate change vulnerabilities could even incentivize arms control, right? All states will be facing mounting financial pressures to ensure the safety, reliability, and resilience of their arsenals to climate change impacts. So states may find it mutually beneficial and fiscally necessary to reduce the size of their arsenals. So with that very hopeful note, maybe that's a, a good positive place to end, but thank you so much for your time and attention and listening to me drone on for 40 minutes. Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging with your questions and feedback.